Today is Tuesday, July 22nd, 2014, and this is the beginning of an interview with Mr. James Vaughn at the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center in Fremont, Ohio. Mr. Vaughn is 92 years old, having been born on March 15th, 1922. My name is Julie Miley, Manuscripts Assistant at the Hayes Center, and I will be conducting this interview. Mr. Vaughn, can you state for the record what war and branch of service you served? Okay, I began in World War II in the Army, uh, 20 October 1942. Okay. Now, when you entered the military, were you drafted or did you enlist? Very interesting. I like interesting. I applied for the U.S. Navy as in pilot training. I was on. I was, my records were in Mansfield Courthouse, County Courthouse, and it burned. The, the room burned. <laughs> I didn't know that. And then suddenly I get this greetings from your friends and relatives in World War. It was a draft notice. And I thought to myself, well, they can't draft me because I'm already waiting for my shot in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Well, I went, I went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, the U.S. Army, for basic training. Did you really? Yeah, because the records were no longer in Mansfield, they were burned up. Wow. <laughs> Anyhow, I didn't really like Camp Shelby, Mississippi, because we had to lay in the firing, so-called firing range with a wooden rifle that had never or could ever shoot even even a pellet. It was it was practice. Oh, okay. So you laid there in the mud and you had some corporal standing over you, making sure you squeezed the trigger of this wooden rifle properly. Well, this was part of the harassment in the tr so-called training. And one day, when you're up, when you're in laying there doing your thing, he called cease fire. He said, of course, we, all we had to do is just do nothing. <laughs> and he said, anybody that has an AGCT score, which is Army General Classification Test okay. score, of a hundred or more, report to the orderly room. Well, I had a score of 180, 128, I knew that. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy to pass, to leave that wooden rifle. And I didn't know what for. Well, what it was, they were going to accord us the opportunity to, to become members of the Army Air Corps and get training on aviation. So from there, I went to Florida. In Florida, I started my army training all over my, because they had already lost shots, records, etc., etc. Of course, all right. <laughs> Anyhow, after we finished the in the training there, the basic training. I was sent to Keesterfield, Mississippi, in, and enrolled in the Army Air Aircraft and Engine course. I went through that and <clears throat> passed it, I guess. And so they sent me then to Willow Run, Michigan, Ypsilanti, Michigan, to the Ford Motor Plant, who was built building B-24s. And I went went to there in in the actual factory mm -hmm. where they were building B-24s and finished up with an advanced B-24 uh, training thing. Okay. From there I went to Tucson, Arizona to fly. Every day you'd fly six hours today, four hours tomorrow, and this was a repeating thing. And every three days you were supposed to get a three-day pass. Well, 
and or if the weather would stop mm -hmm. it. Well, it never never rained in Tucson, Arizona. So you just <laughs> that was, and so I was doing that, and then I was liking this because I was able to fly six and four, six and four, becoming more proficient in this airplane, mm -hmm. which was not an H model; it was a D model. <clears throat> what What are the difference? Well, they, they as they go, went along, they improved. Okay. The B-24, which started with an A in 1938, oh, I never knew that. Okay. and it just progressed up to the A, C, D, E, okay. and ours was an a. then they were doing H's in, okay. in Willow Run. And so, <clears throat> from there, of course I went to Tucson, mm -hmm. and I got to fly all I wanted to fly, and then some. and. And I really didn't know, I knew someplace that I'd, I wouldn't be staying at Tucson just merely flying. Mm -hmm. So I got a set of orders to go to Alamogordo Army Air Base to report. And I reported there mm -hmm. and they were forming the 450th Bomb Group. And so they assigned, they, they had assigned 10 people to each one of their the projected airplanes. Okay. And so I ended up being one one of ten, a ten man crew. Okay. And we trained as a ten man crew until they decided we were proficient enough to go overseas. Um, did you all have different jobs in that crew? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you had a pilot, mm -hmm. co-pilot, navigator. Bombardier, radio operator, engineer, flight engineer, mm -hmm. and then we had a nose nose turret gunner, uh, and I was a Martin upper turret turn upper being in the passenger compartment, mm -hmm. and then you had a ball turret gunner, mm -hmm. and you had a tail gunner. And you had two waste gunners, and so that's how you'd finish. Up, have this crew fly full, full of ten okay. in combat, and that's what went on. And we trained on the white sands of New Mexico, <laughs> and we didn't know it, but this is part of the a bomb thing too. Really. You know, that was still going. We Manhattan Project, we knew nothing about that. We also knew that if we were in the wrong place on the White Sands, that the Army artillery was shooting at us. Not to trying to shoot us down, but shoot by, by us so we could see we were in the wrong place. Yeah. But we didn't know why. <laughs> but anyhow, eventually they decided that we maybe were or maybe they needed us badly, I don't mm -hmm. know which, but they decided it was ready, we were ready to be combat qualified. So they sent us to Harrington, Kansas, and did some ma minor updates on our airplanes. Mm -hmm. And then they sent, started us up back to, to where we would be going. We, of course, we didn't know where this was at. But we did head for the East Coast. We landed in Florida, Brinkenfield, Puerto Rico, and then we went to Recife, Brazil, Natal, Brazil, and then flew to North Africa as individuals, individual crews. And luckily, and then on, then we went on to Casablanca, Chateaubriand, and across to Italy. We landed in Manduria, Italy, which had been an Italian fighter base, which, which, as they could, as as Italy capitulated. Mm -hmm. The Germans used this as an airfield temporarily 
and when they moved up and the Mark Clark's 5th Army moved up, they had to move up too, okay. beyond, and so we got Manduria. Manduria was not, was what it was, was a compacted dirt gravel runway, and that was our home, our new home. We got, since we were the first ones to land there, mm -hmm. we found a concrete building and that was ours. The first ones that got there. Mm -hmm. Of course it was leaking and all this other stuff, but it, was, it wasn't a tent. Right. <laughs> and of course, keep in mind, this is, this is in December. Okay. 20 December, we, we landed there. So we trained until, practiced and trained in the meantime, our other people from the 450th are coming by ship. Oh, really? And so they came, showed up, and by, by 8th of January, we did our first mission. And it was to Mostar, Yugoslavia. It was the first time we ever had been to a combat mission. And we had flight. And so we ended up with holes, but nobody was injured, nobody was killed, mm -hmm. and our airplanes all made a round trip that day. Do you remember what that felt like, that first mission? Do you remember that feeling? Yeah. <laughs> I, I sure do. Mustar was the problem. At one time, that might have been considered an easy mission, but mm -hmm. to us, it was, it was our first. They were shooting at us, you know, and so we dropped our bombs on it. But uh, then we come back, and eventually we we got through four, to our 14th mission. Our three uh, researchers to the library. Is how I supposed to stay? You keep going. Okay. <laughs> on my 14th mission, the which I did, I didn't think it was going to be my 14th mission. I was supposed to go to the Isle of on rest to rest camp. They woke me up about three o'clock in the morning and said, "You're, you up? Your airplane? You better get your airplane." And I said, "Oh, I said that C-47 isn't here already." I said, "You aren't going on C-47." <laughs> I said, our, our airplane, Judy, is, is out, out of commission. That didn't make any difference. You're, and so I went to the briefing, and I found out I was supposed to be on Sigurd Nil Nilsson's crew, because he had several people who couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So I ended up being a tail gunner that day. Of course, we knew we knew these jobs pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, our, my crew pretty much rotated around and practiced all this stuff anyhow. But uh, so they had a briefing, and on February twenty second, nineteen forty four, it showed the map of Europe was there, and it says Steyr. Yugoslavia, this, 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 had all these targets on that big map, and it said Regensburg. Well, this didn't really, we weren't that good in geography, but there was, was, this was where the M.E. Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes would be produced. And this was planned by Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. As, as a joint effort. They call it Big Week, February 20th through 25th. And so, at the, our part of it in the air business, the 8th Air Force was coming to Germany mm -hmm. from England, and we were supposed to be coming from Italy to Germany. So it was a combined effort. Well, here we are, too long, and 
whenever you got close to a mountain, a lot of times, you'd, all of a sudden a flight would be coming up. And so it wasn't even a fun trip getting there to Regensburg. <laughs> and over the Regens, over the target, Over the target, we lost number three and number four engine on one side. In other words, you got one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Three and four went out of commission, out of control. Is that because you got hit or they just yeah. went out? No. Flak okay. coming, coming up, up to us. Mm -hmm. And so this knocked those two engines out. And the pilot at that point pushed the bailout bell. <clears throat> now, that was not a wrong decision necessarily for him, but his four people up front, navigator, bombardier, ra radio, flight engineer, and nose gunner left because they could get out. But we're in the back, but and we can't do anything because we're out of control. Well, luckily he feathered the propellers on those two disabled engines. Fe do you know what I mean by no. fe oh, fe feathering engines? What it did was take a conventional propeller mm -hmm. that pulls and turns it in the sh slipstream so it's like this. It might be like that. He got those two feathered. And this stopped them before they were dragging out, him out of control. Okay. So he said to me, and I was in the back of the turret fighting, I will fight my own private war. And Vaughn, get your, excuse me, get your ass up front. I need, I need a little help. So I came up there and I got in the right seat and between the two of us we sat there with those rudder pedals pushed one against the other to keep it in going in flight. And we got from the target area to the Austro Yugoslav border. By this time we were in between two mountain Alp, the Alps mountain chains we could see they were converging. Mm -hmm. By this time, we'd also used up almost all of our fuel because demands on two engines were on full speed. And we were almost, we had already got rid of the bombs. We were almost out of ammo. And what was the choice? <laughs> so, so I said to Nielsen, I said, Looks like this is where we get off. And so he said, get get the rest of them on the Bombay catwalk, mm -hmm. get, get them out. And uh, so Kiriakos, the, the ball turret gunner, he was there and Waldrop, the the radio operator who was a, a waste gunner, he was there. Mm -hmm. And my own nose turret gunner, Bobby Hahn, who was also drafted into this operation, he was standing there and he says, I ain't going. And I said, Bobby, you gotta go. I ain't going. I don't know what he was gonna do. I, <laughs> I socked him in the jaw. And then he fell out. And then he grabbed a hold of the catwalk. And so I stomped my feet and he just left. And then I turned around and I waved to the pilot and I dived out. And then all of a sudden you're on the ground in the snow. And I said to myself, Jimmy boy, I think you're in a little trouble. <laughs> So I, cl I climbed out of the, out of the snow amp, t grabbing a hold of a tree, mm -hmm. a, a sapling or whatever you want to say, and finally got up to the level of where and stomped around and said, "Well, 
What are you going to do now? Well, I'm talking to myself, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm praying, to, praying to the good Lord too, and so by this time it's getting towards evening. In the meantime, we had a flight suit with two pockets down here, and they were supposed to have this escape kit. This mm -hmm. escape kit. Well, one of them popped open with it. It didn't have a zipper. It had a button popped open. It went. The other one had all it had was a compass and a rubber flask in it. So I didn't have any any rations or anything in mine. But hmm. anyhow, the flask came in handy because what you could do is you could pack snow in it, put it in, in next to your skin and eventually uh -huh. melt it to where you get a little water. Okay. The compass didn't mean nothing because it was only this big around and every time it saw an ore bearing mountain it just went that direction. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you don't worry about that at this point in time. You, you, you get up, once you you know we better not go to sleep, mm -hmm. so what you do is you settle down with the wrap in your parachute and every so often get back up because you don't want because it's easy to die then. And so I did that for all of the night the rest of the night. And then the next morning as soon as the sun was up, you can bet I was up too. And you really you didn't need the compass because hmm. the sun comes up in the east. Yep. So you knew you were going to Yugoslavia or going south. You're, you're in, uh, on, you don't know even where you're at, but you know you're probably in Austria or something or Yugoslavia. So if you keep going south, you're going to eventually get uh, fur further away from where you need, where you are. Yeah. And so it was to me. It was not a problem. Every time I, I, survived one day. The next morning I get up. I know where the sun was, mm -hmm. and I just keep going south. By this time, I thought, well, what's your chances? And then you don't want to think about that. But you know. You got to keep going. So you say a few more prayers and you just keep on going. On the fifth day, by myself, I look in the distance on a little hillock there, and it looks like there's two people. Of course, by this time you're not sure what's going on because you know you could go snow blind very easily. But anyhow, I walked to where they, where I thought these were, and they weren't there. But there was footsteps away from that spot to another spot. And so I followed the footsteps to that spot, and here I'm looking into the biggest gun I ever saw in my life. It looked like the barrel was big around. Probably wasn't, you know. But it's probably 50 or 54 caliber, <laughs> <laughs> and the guy has got is 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 probably middle aged or whatever, and he doesn't know who I am and I don't know who he is, and but finally, they they decided maybe I, I need a little help, so he, he and his wife had been up in this little hillock and digging hay out of the side of the ridges mm -hmm. to feed their animals up there. And uh, so they give me some bread and cheese and water. Most delicious meal I ever had in my life. So, and then he indicated that I was supposed to follow his wife. And of course, he had the gun behind me. Mm -hmm. But uh, he walked, and they found their own little home, someplace. Mm -hmm. 
and what it was was a combination home and barn. They had some animals in one side of it, and they lived in the other part. Okay. They gave me some more bread, and some more goat cheese, water, and indicated I was supposed to go up in the hay mile. I went up in the hay mile gladly and covered myself with hay. They took my parachute. But there was a reason for that, but I won't go into that. They were they were taking this stuff. Anything they could get, they needed. So, or the partisans needed it, or Chetney mm -hmm. needed it. Somebody needed that stuff. And I didn't know that at the time. Okay. But anyhow, I didn't need to parachute it anyhow. I had nice hay to cover up. In. <laughs> That's a good exchange, huh? <laughs> and so I'm, uh, I'm up there and falling asleep after five days like this. I, and I fell asleep and I really slept. And then I, I looked downstairs, down. And of course there was a couple of animals down there. And there were three young men standing there talking to each other in a language I never heard of. And the three young men, they had military style caps on, not this kind, but mm -hmm. you know, the ones you fold and okay. put in your, behind your belt or whatever. It had a little red star in the center of it, which didn't mean anything to me either. Okay. But that was, I found eventually, the Tito's partisans. These three young men were supposed to be taking me someplace else. Of course, I didn't know that. Uh, so the, they fed me some more food and water and indicated, and the three got young men, one left, and when he's almost out of sight, the second one indicated to me I was supposed to follow him. I got in line with him, and the third one, finally, way in the back, I could see him back, way back, behind us, and we started walking. We walked and walked and walked till it was dark, stopping occasionally for water in a stream or whatever. <clears throat> and then we found another I wouldn't call it a village, but there was three houses. And so these th three young men looked the things over and decided it was safe to go there. Because the Germans were in this area also. <laughs> so, as we got close to the one big bigger house, four guys jumped out and they were my people that had that bailed out with me. Oh my gosh. That was the remainder of the crew, of the, of the five that got out. The other five were over the target, so at this point in time, we, we didn't know what they were doing, you know, or whether they're dead or alive or what. <laughs> but these four guys were there. Pilot, radio operator, oh and so, <laughs> so we had a joyous reunion. Wow! And wow! To say the least. They give us some more food. Generally, the same things. Mm -hmm. And we slept that evening, and then the next morning, we started our trek south. And the same thing. Three young men, not the same not three, the same ones. Okay. different ones. We, they suddenly had the five of us, and there was three of them. One, and then had us plus the second, mm -hmm. and then the third one would be way back. And when they, whenever necessary, they would divert from a straight line because <coughs> of mountains and mm -hmm. whatever. or whatever. Maybe Germans, you know. It was never a straight line anywhere, it, but the uh, uh, avoidance maneuver, I'd call it. Anyhow, this went on for approximately 30 days. We're keeping going south. 
walking. So, and one day we come, we come across the mountain and we look and there's a beautiful little town right there. That was Barani, Montenegro, Yugoslavia. And of course we didn't know anything other than it was the nicest thing we'd seen in a long time. I like that. But it was rather, I, I have no idea how many people. It was a combination of Tito's partisans, natives that lived there, mm -hmm. and they also had a bunch of Italian, ex, Italian prisoners that had been turned over when they, when Italy capitulated. Okay. They used them as slaves. Well, hmm. You know, I mean, did did manual work because mm -hmm. many of these other guys were out fighting wars. Hmm. So, and they put us with five British people, British, British Army people. Okay. These five were uh, an intelligence outfit that had radios in con and in contact with Cairo, Egypt, and the 15th Air Force in Battery, Italy. And they, and they said to us, well, they would be getting us back to Italy somehow, okay. by boat or whatever. So, so the British, and they put, give us new uniforms, British uniforms, with shoes. Not, they didn't necessarily fit, but they were shoes. Yeah. And, and first real bath we had in five weeks. <laughs> At a, at, a, at a powerhouse where the hot water was. Hey. And, so, and then they kept feeding us and treating us great. And then one day, and then Measure Smith 210 flew across, opened his bomb bays, and these canisters came out. Well, we thought they were bombs. Yeah. But they exploded, and what it was was propaganda leaflets they were dropping, uh. warning the Yugoslavs not to assist allies in protection. So anyhow, well, after, he, after, he, after he flew off, we look there, and here comes a little old three-engine airplane, mm -hmm. and it corkscrewed into the, this little dirt strip and landed to, and came up to the operations section there and and it, what it was was they bringing supplies into the to the to, to the people okay from Italy and uh, you know probably from the allies mm -hmm. in Italy and and told them how much fuel they could take out of that airplane so they drained fuel under the watchful eye of these three people on the Italian airplanes, hmm. and so that we'd have enough to get back to Italy. I mean, it was a mutual agreement hmm. of that. And anyhow, then the five, mil the five British climbed on that hmm. were with us, and us five plus two more airmen had shown up just days before. Wow. We got on that little old airplane mm -hmm. and, it, and we got headed for Italy. Wow. And it was. We were about halfway between Italy and Yugoslavia. This middle engine blew an oil line across the. And all of a sudden there was just dirty oil all over our windshield. Oh my gosh. But those guys, of course, they flew on instruments. Mm -hmm. And then they were trying to, the windshield wiper, you couldn't even see out it, but they actually landed with flying like this to land that thing at Lecce, Lecce Air Base, which was the new home of the, four, of the 90, 98th bomb group. Hmm. And they took, and so we went in there and they fed us and they drove us to Manduria. Manduria said, well, you wanted it. At, at the Barry at the 15th Air Force headquarters. Mm -hmm. So they put us on a staff car 
and we rode to Barry, and then the interrogation started. Because nobody had ever reported what we had been experiencing. So, so we, we were interrogated for a couple of days, given more u new uniforms, mm -hmm. and they said that they were going to take us to the United States. So the five of us climbed in that airplane, brand new uh, transport, Lockheed Constellation. I never knew there was such a thing. It was there, shiny, rascally, beautiful. They flew us. They flew us to Casablanca, refueled, and they flew us direct to Bowling Air Force Base, mm -hmm. at Washington. Really. And another got in a staff car, and they drove us to the Pentagon. The Pentagon started interrogating us again and again and again till we every minor comma or, don, or period or whatever had to be in the right spots of the five of us that, that came out because at this point in time partisans under communist Tito mm -hmm. and Chetniks under Mihailovich were deadly enemies of each other as well as Hmm. And the Germans, allegedly. Okay. Well, they had to sort these things out, evidently. And so, once they were done with us in the, in, in the Pentagon, they sent us to the funny farm at, in Virginia that is now CIA headquarters. Call it the funny farm? Well, <laughs> it was Office of Strategic Services. Okay. But then that's now a CIA. Okay. But that, and there we get the interrogations again, because they're they're they they got to be right about mm -hmm. this stuff. So after they were finished with us, they give us thirty day leaves, and we could go to our home, wherever our homes were. So I rode the train back to Cary, Ohio. And it was it was it was not going to supposed to stop at Cary, but it had to get water or something. And so when it got got there, I just got out of the darn airplane, and I mean off of the train, and I looked around. Said, "Well, I'll just go walk over to the high school and see if there's any Vaughns over there." Walked over there. Of course, they they didn't even know I was. They knew it already been shot down, but they didn't know I was safe. But my mother and dad had gotten a, yeah. a, a notice that I had first when I was shot down, mm -hmm. and second when I'd been saved. So here I am, looking at all those fawns and other people in a high school, and my dad comes and picks me up in the car and we go home. We can't even talk about how what happened. What happened? Because it's classified top secret. So here I am, a local hometown hero. I can't even tell them how what's <laughs> going on. But that's what well, that was that story. Mm. So after that, I went to Atlantic City, New Jersey, to so-called rest camp. Okay. And after thirty days there of drinking and trying to chase girls and stuff like that, <laughs> you get assigned. I was supposed to go to Fort Myers, Florida. Guess what? To be a gunnery instructor. <coughs> I didn't want to be one. So I, I flunked the test for him. On purpose? On purpose. <laughs> and four other guys with me did too. And so they sent, oh, yeah. us, they sent us to Laredo, Texas, to a gunnery school where I had already graduated from, and we flunked it again. So they didn't know what to do with us. Well, what did you want to do? I did. I wanted to be able to fly. 
And if you were a gunnery instructor, you'd be all instruction mm -hmm. on the ground. Yep. Because they were going to use your smarts. Yeah. So that was the reason for that. Okay. So they didn't really know what to do with us. <laughs> so they gave us the choice of three assignments. One was Salt Lake City, Utah. Another was Lincoln, Nebraska. And the third one was Westover Air Force Base, Massachusetts. Well, I'd never been to Massachusetts. <laughs> so I thought, well, I might as well take a shot at that. So I did. I selected Westover, and uh, I managed on the way to Westover to stop and, on a train. And <laughs> I left early, stayed, and I programmed, and we had agreed, there was three of us, we had to agree that we'd be in Springfield, Massachusetts on a certain day at a certain time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, know, I still don't believe it. It happened. <laughs> really? <laughs> and so, so we, we call, we, we call, we get, get with the base and the base comes and picks us up put, and signs us. And of course they have to, now the new interrogation is how come it took us so darn long to get there? <laughs> but, but the three of us held together on this one. <laughs> so I ended up being a flight instructor, really? flight engineer on training B-24 pilot people really? for combat. Well, of course you, when you're young and full of vinegar like that, and allegedly you're 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 using this to to use the, use the, the people. Mm -hmm. Oh, we drank too much, and we were obnoxious. And but we we were trying to terrorize the natives, I guess, or something. <laughs> so we were down we were down there in Chickabee Falls, Massachusetts, getting drunk on our minds, out of our minds, one evening. And I said, I hear some music up the hill there. I said, that, that must be a bar we haven't been to yet. <laughs> and so we climbed up the hill, and it wasn't a bar. What it was was a USO with music. Ah. And all those beautiful women with doting mothers watching them carefully. <laughs> well, I... I tried to dance with a couple of them, but I was much worse for wear. And they tried hard to be nice, but it wasn't really working all that well. And I said to this guy who was with me, I said, see that brunette over there, that beautiful thing? I'm going to marry that girl. And he says, you're drunker than I thought you were. <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. But I'm coming back. And I said, I already found out when she's going to be, the next time she's going to be here. And I chased her, and I chased her till she caught me. And that's your Jeanette. <laughs> and she, and oh. I can't believe this. She come, her mother loved me. Well, how could she not? Well. <laughs> <laughs> and her aunt was a great king, and, and and they took a spoiled young teenager and made a real woman out of her for me. It she was the, boil the first water year. The first year, here. first year was terrible because she was a spoiled brat. But between those two and me, we finally got, got her, her shaped up, huh? I guess so. And so, sixty-five years and six months together. Oh. Yeah. And get products like this. <laughs> oh. Magnificent. How many other children did you have? I only had one other. Okay. And he's it. But we we got a lot of great grandkids and grand grandkids <laughs> and a great families. We just came from the Vaughn reunion. Mm -hmm. So it's just been unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But you're you did not end your career at Westover. No, I did what, not. What did you do after that? Well, after Westover, 
Oopsie, there we go. That's, whoa. <laughs> After West, I was at Westover a long time. Okay. I was in, in con I had jobs like flight engineer in air evacuation. Okay. C-54s, C-47s, and we flew around the United States hauling patients in or out of various hospitals. Oh. And <clears throat> so I was there a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, from probably you went there after you came back to the States. So that would have been maybe late 44, yeah. 45, mm -hmm. till 1955, oh, wow. 56. Yeah. We can't exactly, my brother was probably about a year when we moved. Yeah. Yeah. And we went to McGuire Air Force Base. Well, you went to Saudi Arabia though. But I went to Saudi Arabia for one year between the, the While we were at Westo. Westo. Yeah. And we lived in South Hadley. Wow. Yeah. We had a nice house there, but and then we were reassigned to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, Wrightstown. Mm -hmm. And from there <laughs> We were there for six years. Yeah. So there was a lot of consistency to yeah, where it seems we like lived. It. Yeah. And so and then one day I called Jeanette up and I said Ohio Gazimas. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, we're going to Japan. But she hadn't been far off. I mean, Massachusetts, New Jersey. New Jersey might have been a stretch yeah. when she moved there. And here she's going to Japan. <laughs> so we, we, went, we went to Japan. Oh. <laughs> Unbelievable. And we were... Itazuki Air Base, which is the southernmost part of Japan. Okay. <clears throat> and we were there for quite some time. Well, three years. Three and years. then we went up to Yokota. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Outside of Tokyo for a year. Wow. And then let's see, what what Kansas? Wichita, Kansas. For McConnell Air Base. McConnell Air Force Base. Mm. Yeah. I was there what, approximately a year or so. And then you went to Thailand. And then I went to Thailand. Jeez. And I had Karat, Thailand. Oh, and well, then... It is okay. Yeah, okay, Yakota. And of course... The tunnel. Yeah, okay. They, they were staying. They were staying in... in the, with, yeah, we stayed in Kansas. Okay. Yeah, at Derby, Kansas. Right. So then, when I came back from that time... Well, you were reassigned yeah. to Kansas, yeah, to McConnell, McConnell yeah. in Kansas, yeah. yeah. Hmm. He, in Thailand, they, you were support to the Vietnam War yeah. with the F-105s. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, sp I spent the last 10 years of my or actually 11 years of my life in, in fighters as an as a aircraft maintenance supervisor for, well, as a nine-level chief master sergeant. So wow. that, that's not quite like God, but it's close to him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to know all, uh, almost all of those heroes that, and up in Hanoi and stuff like that. Yeah. And you knew them because f fighters are different. Fighter people are different. We even knew the, you know, the kids and ch we know their kids and everything else. Oh. Amazing. Wow. But anyhow. Then he came back to McConnell. Yeah. In Kansas. And then they went back to Japan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> to Misawa and to Inazuke. northern, northern, no. way northern Japan. Okay. And then uh, we went from there to Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. Way southern Japan. Yeah. The beach. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, I was 
I was nearing the end of the road, not the end of the road, maybe the beginning of another thing. Uh, Could we but look at it? I would have stayed in the Air Force forever. Really? Yeah. All I had to do is cut me open it, and it doesn't bleed red, it bleeds red, white, and blue. Hey, I like that. <laughs> and so we, we went to Bergstrom, Bergstrom Air Force Base Austin, in Texas. Texas. Okay. And there I was for about a year or so, <coughs> waiting for retirement. Mm -hmm. And I retired with my wife and a poodle. And of course, by this time, Sherry's she's back in the States, married to a, a Navy guy. Well, he wasn't a Navy guy though then. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, she, but she finished up her college degree and stuff like that. And had a, had a, my first grandson. Aww. So, anyhow, things have been something. Yeah. And I can't hardly. I don't even believe it myself. But anyhow, Jeanette and I got in that Studebaker, and they we took we took kids. some some. <laughs> Household goods with us to Wichita, or on the way to Wichita, mm -hmm. and we decided, well, this would be temporary stuff until we could get all of the permanent stuff out of housing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know where we wanted to retire because she was from Massachusetts, I'm from Ohio, mm -hmm. and we're in there in Kansas, and we've been all over. And we're not sure where we want to retire. One of the jokes was, well, we're going to retire where the 62 studio acre breaks down. <laughs> well, it broke down twice, but we didn't, we didn't, we, I fixed it. He still has <laughs> this car today. I still got it. I found that one in Okinawa, and we still got that thing. Hopefully it'll be hers one of these oh, days. Oh, that's cool. But then, so, it's unbelievable. I don't even believe this myself. I pinch myself and it doesn't go away. But uh, uh, when I went, when, when we were visiting my brother in Broken Arrow, mm -hmm. Mary, his wife, says, well, what are you going to do now? He said, you're in your mid-fifties. You're not ready for the rocking chair. And I said, no, I'm not. I don't even really want one. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I said, we're just going to go and drive around this United States, and probably where the Studebaker breaks down, that's where we'll go, jokingly. But I knew I could fix it. <laughs> so Thanks for a good story, though. <laughs> Jeanette and I and the poodle, we went. We went to OSU Okmulgee, interviewed there, mm -hmm. not necessary to see if they had any openings. Ah. And for a for teacher? Mm-hmm. Well, they didn't have any, but they, they they liked me. And I said, well, we're going to drive around this United States till I find a good place where I can settle down teaching. Mm -hmm. And because I really ended up being a teacher my whole life, one way or another. Mm -hmm. So, well, we headed east. We went till we got to the ocean. Went south in Florida, up north into Maine, crossed to Ohio where I came from, and well, there are people along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Stops. And stops. Yeah. <laughs> and so, then Bobby is at Air Force Academy, so we got to go that direction, right? And we Colorado go to the, we go to the Air Force Academy, north, to some friends of mine in Montana. From there, I go eat to, to the West Coast. And and we, whenever we got to the ocean, we just went south to get Southern California, hmm. turned left, and went back to, to Wichita and and Okmulgee. And I said, well, I said, if you have any, have you got any prospects of? needing me, my talents here in Okmulgee. And they said, no, but there is one guy that's talking about retiring 
in the automotive department. I said, well, I, I guess I'll just enroll in automotive t mechanics and see what happens. Well, what happened was they started utilizing my talents in the mechanical areas. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being an assistant instructor on a GI Bill. <laughs> really? And, Jer and Jeanette was in a nice, re nice ho rental house, mm -hmm. and she was. She for a while she worked there at Tech. Yeah. In the, uh, in the food service. Yeah. Not very long. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved OSU Oak Muggy. Yeah. That's so, Oklahoma State University. Yeah. Oak Mulgee. Okay. Right. That's what OSU. I, it gets confusing in Ohio. Yes. Yeah, so for the Ohio. Well, State I'm University. A, I'm a, I'm OSU Ohio yeah. too, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, it's been my. It was. I spent 15 years wow. teaching. Wow. And I've had a, a fantastic life. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Sound been, like it. So, is there anything else I need to ask you? No. Is there anything else you need to ask him? I think he did great. Uh, do you think about it often? Your military career? Yes. Do you? Does it seem like it was that long ago? Well, even you know, early on when I first retired, I couldn't get used to the fact. That, that I'd wake up to the jet engines, because you'd hear them, hear them starting up, because you'd be living close to them. Mm -hmm. And if the F-105 was a, had the strongest and biggest engine ever, any fighter ever had it. Mm -hmm. And so you'd hear these things booming in the morning, and you knew that, well, we're going to get some up in the air today, you know. It was amazing, and I huh. thought I'd never get used to not hearing that. But I did like o McConnell mm -hmm. because, well, I guess I just like people. And you can see, if you work at it, mm -hmm. you can find beauty in it anywhere in this world. Very true. Very true. And, and he's a good example of that. He shows me things that... <laughs> It's amazing. Every single day when yeah. get in the car. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> mm. um, have you ever participated in any of the honor flights down to D.C. or anything yes, like I that? Yes, I did. What did you think about those? Uh, I hope we keep them up because in Oklahoma they're talking about whenever they get through all the WW2 guys, they're going to go for Korea. I think that's only fair. Huh? I think that's only fair. I, th I think it's a great thing. I'm with you on that. Yeah. You went, was it two years ago? Yeah. Two two September's ago. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard it's experience of a lifetime. People you know that only good things about the, it. The thing, the thing that gets to me mm -hmm. is because I get on an airplane with 97 other guys and each one of them's got a caretaker. Yeah. But Many of those people have never been on an airplane. Really? Yeah. And many of them have been, after World War II, they just went back home. Yeah, and on ship. To yeah, their same communities. So this is the first, for many of those, it had been their first time. And for many, many of them, that was the first time they'd ever got to Washington, D.C. Wow. So, and me having... Traveled the world, yeah, pretty much. Wow! I just, I was so proud of these guys. I helped push them around because I could still push a wheelchair. Oh <laughs> so. Did you have a caretaker with you, or were you were you your own caretaker? No, he ha did. He, he go had with somebody, a close friend. Aww, yeah. yeah. But uh, and I, I had a great, great wife, great kids, <laughs> and and all of that. Can't world's, beat it. World's richest man. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. 
You belong to any veteran organizations? I belong to VFW. Yeah. I'm a life member of that. Yeah. Uh, and Air Force Sergeants Association. Nice. And uh, of course, Lions Club, Elks Lodge. <laughs> Staying active. <laughs> I like that. Church. Church? Oh, the church. Yeah. Definitely. Good. So. I, I don't participate with VFW. Mm -hmm. I I joined them when I was in Japan just okay. to be, just to join them. Right. And but I am a member of the one in Okmulgee. I participate whenever they want me to there. Okay. So, mm. as a matter of fact, I I think I did it in Henrietta the other day. Sometimes I get to be a guest speaker for yeah. places. That's neat. Yeah. At schools or yeah. um, various places for Veterans Day, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and I don't have a great amount of medals or anything like that. I do have two distinguished unit citations from the 450th. Yeah. Because, and I had Army conduct, good conduct, and Air Force good conduct, mm -hmm. and longevity ribbons, and all this other stuff. And commendation ribbons. It's a lot of times, I think the service, lots of time, whenever you transfer and do a good job, mm -hmm. they give you a commendation ribbon <laughs> in, in lieu of, of any additional money. Or All right, <laughs> the pay raise, you get another uh, They treated me good there, too. Yeah. So, so I've been a chief for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, but since they created, Basically, the rank. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, looking back at it all, would you do it again? In a minute. <laughs> and you know something? What's up? In, in everybody, there are somewhere there's a little good. In, if you just find, find that, you can make him a little bit better. <laughs> so. I've had I've had some people that were, would nobody would hand would, thought they had to send them to jail, but somewhere or other I always saw a spark in almost everybody. Not everybody, but almost everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. Well, I was liked by a lot of people. I can see why. <laughs> not just not just you know not just. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when you spend that much time in the service, mm -hmm. it's kind of, my brother would say, how come he calls, he calls, calls you Jim instead of Sergeant? Mm -hmm. I said, well, because I, I guess I'm Jim to him, but I'm, I said, he's not, he's not Jim to, that guy is not Jim. Mm -hmm. That guy is a colonel or he's a, general or whatever. Right. So I've always kept that in mind. Huh. I I I'm impressed by everybody. Hey. There's always good in somebody. That's right. Hmm. Well, anything you want to add that I didn't ask or Well did I answer most of your questions? You did great. Okay. Yeah. My greatest achievements are two kids, these guys, <laughs> and the Vaughn Bruce O'Clan. That, that's my greatest achievement. Yeah? That sounds and, good. And you're on a team. Oh, I'm honored. <laughs> hey, I like that. All right, we'll close it out on that good note. Yeah, they're, they're